So let me give you a quick overview of the agenda. Uh, they're going to have their five minutes, uh, then we're going to have a break, then we have a question and answer period, and then they're all going to get a two-minute closing. Uh, Thanks, Brian. Good to see you. Thanks, Brian. It's good to see you. Thank you for uh, coming out, everyone. Good to see everybody here today. I think when we talk about politicians, you want to know about three things. You want to know about their motivations, you want to know about their qualifications, and you want to know about their results, whether in or outside of politics. My story starts in the 1950s when my uh, family immigrated to Scot from Scotland to ca Canada. And we settled in a small town just outside of Toronto called Thistletown. My father worked for de Havilland and worked in Malton, which became Pearson Airport. And uh, in, uh, in about 1955, my father tragically died in a car accident. So my mother was left with uh, raising four boys under the age of 10. And what she did was she instilled in us many values. And those values still ring true today. Hard work, being frugal, and the importance of education. And when I left high school, I took the year off and I was crossing Canada with my friends. We were heading to Vancouver to spend that year between high school and university. And we ended up in Calgary for a three-day visit. And I never left. I love this city. It's a great city. And I was so impressed with the people and the attitude here. And I came to realize that this is where I wanted to settle. This is where I wanted to go to school. This is where I wanted to raise a family. And this is where, where all the opportunities lay before me. And that's before I got to the mountains and found out about the great skiing out here. I entered the University of Calgary and I supported myself by working as a bartender. I like to say I worked on Electric Avenue before electricity because it goes back so far. But the opportunities came, and I've had a great business career over the last 25 years. I worked for General Foods, and I worked for TELUS. I was a successful entrepreneur when I broke the telephone monopoly of $25 million. And if you think it's easy taking on a monopoly, I got a, I got a story for you. I'll see you at the break. I was a best-selling Canadian author. And so I've worked for blue chips. I've worked for small and medium enterprises. I've been a successful entrepreneur, but the thing I'm most proud of was when I worked for a not-for-profit a little not-for-profit called Tourism Calgary, where I went around the world promoting this great city. So when you talk about how do you view Calgary, I think I view Calgary with a different lens than a lot of other people. I look at Calgary as in terms of how fortunate we are and how fortunate to have the opportunities we have before us. I've been all over North America. I've been to probably many, many, uh, probably every major center in North America. And we are very fortunate here in Calgary, very fortunate indeed. When I was uh, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I, I worked in the community a great deal with youth and stuff, and I ended up being community president. The community came forward and asked me to be president because we had some challenges within the community. There was a battle between young families coming in and the seniors that had built that great community, and I was brought in as the peacekeeper. And I'm proud to say in three years, I got everybody flying in the right direction, and I got everybody seeing the value of both sides of the argument. And we had some great uh, successes while I was there. And it wasn't me alone. It was myself and the board. We doubled the footprint, the size of the hall. We put in a skating rink, and we put in some traffic lights so kid could, kids could get to school. Um, and then just three years ago, roughly, the community came to me again, and they wanted me to run. And they wanted me to run in Ward 6, and they wanted to be an alderman. So I took up the challenge, and I was successful in defeating a two-term incumbent. And I say that quite often, and last debate I said it as well, and I, I didn't realize at the time that it comes with a cost. It comes with a cost to the person who lost, and that person is here today. And I feel I, feel I have to apologize, because it wasn't meant to be an insult to Craig. I, I wanted to just point out my success, but I forgot that when you're successful, quite often someone else hurts because of that. So Craig, my apologies to you. I, uh, I want to shake your hand, I do. Craig asked if I'm going to buy a beer, and I always buy a beer. Uh, Craig and I actually played hockey yesterday, but, you know, I want to applaud Craig because, you know what, he got back in the saddle, and he's back here today. And I, I want to congratulate him for taking that charge up, because as everyone knows on this panel, it's not easy running for mayor, and it's not easy being in politics. I want to talk to you a little bit my, about my results now, because my results, I think, are significant, uh, being an alderman. First of all, I brought a billion dollars, that's a billion with a B, billion dollars worth of infrastructure to Ward 6, including the west leg of the LRT. 61 million for the trench on 17th Avenue. 8 million for the west side rec center. 10 million for the Signal Hill Library. Two new interchanges, a new fire hall. But the thing I'm probably most proud of, ladies and gentlemen, is I elevated the fire department to come to the planning table. So they'll be there when we plan new communities, and I think that's critically important. 
I championed artificial turfs. I uh, preserved the brand, Calgary, Heart of the New West, because to do a new brand is a waste of money. We did a ton of research on it in the year 2000, and it's a great brand. The only people who don't seem to like it are uh, certain members of council. I preserved the sister cities relationship when that was in question because we need that. That's, that's an economic advantage that we need to have. And if you like free parking evenings and weekends, that was me as well. So I think I've done well, but more importantly that, I've got perfect council attendance, and I delivered on common sense by voting against the $25 million pedestrian bridge, against the $12 million for the Cecil Hotel, and against the 2008 three-year budget and tax plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you so much for being here today. It's, it's, it's finally inspiring to see that people want to get involved in this next campaign. Uh, the next mayor we're choosing is someone that could potentially be here for a few years. Um, but today I want to talk about why I want to run for mayor and why it's so passionate in my family to give back. Some of you may or may not know I come from a family of cops. A brother is an RCMP officer uh, who was an air marshal in the, after 9-11, any uh, gang unit uh, in Toronto and counterterrorism. I got another brother who's an OPP officer as a, a traffic cop and he'll tell you 100% that speeding kills and you're more likely to be killed by a speeding car than a speeding bullet. And lastly, a sister who is a police officer in London who is in the domestic violence unit. So when I talk about public safety, I don't just talk about safe streets. I talk about safer homes. Now, Calgarians, we built this city. And you should feel safe in it. And that's why, as a police commission, I was proud to bring beat cops to downtown. Give Chief Hansen and the officers the resources they need to do their job to keep us safe. But as we move forward, I want to increase additional safety on LAT platforms and make them safe and clean. Now, you worked hard for your dollars, and you deserve we spend your money properly with value. First thing I'm going to do as mayor, job one, is I am bringing in the Provincial Auditor General to see what has been going on. We've seen over the last three years, we've seen over the last three years a council that can't follow tender process. Hundreds of, how do you lose $123 billion and find it again? I don't know how that happens. And we've had members of council here, and especially our fiscal hawk on council, not find this money. How does that happen? Now, what I want to look at doing is, is also the importance of this city council has to start working better with other orders of government, and especially the province. We need to work together to find solutions for today's challenges. And one thing I want to work with the province and the federal government on is my number one transportation issue is not just only the airport tunnel, but the LRT to the airport. And I'll tell you why it's so important. That LRT to the Portman, we are as a city, as a world, we are a great city, no question, but we're poised to be a world-class city. And we can be a world-class city if we build our downtown that's connected to our airport. That airport is the third largest airport in the, city, uh, in the country. It's the third largest employment center, we have an opportunity of a lifetime to really make our city world class. It's part of my five minutes, so. Uh, you've created vibrant communities. We need to work together to implement sustainable planning. We can't continue to keep moving out. We need to look at moving up. But the reality is, if we don't put the right processes in place to provide housing for things like secondary suites or developing around transit-oriented developments. It will never happen. We will always continue to build out. And places like Airdrie and Okotoks will continue to grow and take our tax dollars out of our community. But ladies and gentlemen, I want to make sure that I want you to know that I'm not just someone who worries about uh, policing and the bottom line. Uh, a, a, a mayor has to be someone who cares for all Calgarians, so we don't leave anyone behind. As, as an alderman, I worked with Mayor Bronconi on the Westgate Hotel project. That project was about getting families, homeless families, off the streets and working with local agencies. To me, that is what being a mayor is about, is making sure that the weakest in our communities are not left behind. And it doesn't have to be a situation where we spend money that's not sustainable. I also believe that the greatest thing about this city are Calgarians and our volunteers. And I want to signal out one particular volunteer, someone like Wayne Stewart, a gentleman who has given back to his community through um, working with the Homeless Foundation. Those are the kind of people that work hard for our communities and they do it with nothing in, in other than just making sure we have a great city. So Wayne, thank you and all the great volunteers that do all that work. <laughs> Lastly, I want to talk about what I think is wrong with the City Council and why it's disconnected. Ladies and gentlemen, 
In the worst economic times, this council gave themselves a 5.5% raise, while many people were suffering losing jobs and maybe job cuts, job cuts to keep their jobs. That 5.5% led to a 12% tax increase that you had to pay. It had nothing to do with hiring more police officers or plowing your streets. It had simply about paying 16,000 people 11%. Do you know if they would have showed leadership and froze their salaries, don't you know what your property tax would be today? 2%. Now you look at the bridge, a $25 million bridge. What I have a problem with the bridge is that you're telling me that you don't have the money to plow our streets, but you can build a $25 million bridge. Those are the questions about priorities. We're going to get back to basics. We're going to do fire police protection. I'm going to plow the streets when it snows. I'm going to pick up your garbage, and I'm going to fix the potholes. And that is local government at its finest. And when we work with uh, volunteer agencies like Homeless Foundation, we will find solutions to make sure that all Calgarians grow in our city. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brian, and the Calgary Leadership Forum for putting this event on. But more importantly, I thank all of you for coming in, uh, out and supporting democracy and caring about your community and its further direction. But before I get into telling you about uh, some of the issues I stand for, I'd like to talk a little bit about myself. Uh, on December 16th, 1969, I was born right here in the Holy Cross Hospital in Calgary. And guess what? I had lots of opportunities growing up. I got to play baseball, hockey, swimming, and all that good stuff uh, that kids get to do. I grew up in the, the local varsity acres, and my, my parents were both... Uh, local public school teachers who, uh, who really uh, got their kids involved in the community. In fact, my mom's here today. Judy Hare, why don't you stand up and give a wave, Ma? You know, she gave me, she gave me those opportunities to participate in that, in that community. But tell you what, that also took a vibrant city to do that. I able to have rinks and I needed uh, ball, ball, ball fields to play in. I needed swimming pools. And those are the kind of opportunities I want to see, not only for today, but for tomorrow, the children of tomorrow who come to this great city. Graduated in 1987 from Sir Winston Churchill, was talented enough to go play a few years of junior hockey. The last year I played for the Alberta Junior Hockey League, Calgary Canucks, and we were fortunate enough to win the, the championship that year. Can anyone hear Bruce Springsteen glory days in the background? <laughs> well, I can hear it playing, but anyways. Went to school to Mount Royal College, was lucky enough to play on the Cougar hockey team, take some classes there. But my second year there, uh, I was a victim of a violent crime. Uh, a drive-by shooting occurred. We didn't know the gentleman who did it. But nevertheless, a gun came out and a bullet was lodged into my spine. The next day, my life changed. But guess what? I rebuilt my life. I went back to school. Eventually got a Canadian Studies degree, eventually got a law degree was uh, honored and privileged to practice law for seven years at the national firm of Fraser Milner Casgrain. About three years ago, I became the MLA for uh, Calgary Buffalo, and it's been an honor and a privilege to represent that community up in the provincial legislature, fighting for things like uh, public health care and public education, and it really has been an honor. But uh, all that and a buck 64, I'll get you a cup of coffee at Tim Hortons. So what am I uh, going to talk about today as becoming your next mayor? I tell you what, I, in my view, the, the real, er or real uh, issue to be discussed is uh, public accountability and public trust. And I am leading by example on that issue. How many uh, people believe that money and power influence things down at City Hall? I tell you what, I'm, right now I'm putting all my donors, anyone who donates to my campaign, it's going on my website. You can see who is donating to my campaign. Second thing I'm going to do, and I actually encourage everyone else up here to do that. Second thing I'm going to do, who's heard that developers have been uh, running City Hall for the last 40 years? Anyone hear that? I'm having a developer and lobbyist registry. When they come down to City Hall, they can sign in and they, they can come see me after that. But public business is going to be done in public when Kent Hare is the mayor. Third thing I'm going to do is bring in an independent auditor. Anyone think that, uh, that uh, sort of dog and pony show that was going on this summer over the audit, one day uh, Mr. McIver said she was a rock star, the next day he's voting to fire her. You know, it, 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 does that not, not seem like uh, something was wrong in that process? We're going to have an independent auditor that reports to you the public, not to City Hall, to report to you, the citizens out there. I believe public trust has been, been broken 
and people see city council as broken, people see city hall as a place where business interests and private interests are, are taken before the public interest. What I will do is do my best to govern in the public good and in the public interest of all citizens of Calgary. Thank you very much for your time and I look forward to sharing more of my ideas later on this afternoon. Take care. Good afternoon and thanks to the Leadership Forum for this opportunity to address Calgarians as we approach this important election. I have a new pair of glasses. I was trying them on uh, over there and they didn't look uh, particularly good so I left them there. So I'm not going to be able to see all my notes. If I miss something, uh, I hope that Brian will remind me. Thanks to all of you for giving up your Sunday to listen and learn and participate as you consider your important role as citizen and voter. With rough seas ahead, voters must ask themselves, who can best steer the ship out of this storm? You might think that came from Moby Dick or from the new Piranha 3D movie, but actually it was written by Tony Seskis in the Calgary Herald way back on July the 25th of this year, when voters actually outnumbered candidates. And candidates must be challenged on what they bring to the role of mayor. They must not be let off the hook with general statements or empty promises. This time, as much as any time, the outcome of the election will affect the way our city develops for years into the future. So what are those critical issues? Calgarians are telling me that they want a council that works together for the good of the city as a whole. They want a mayor who can create a team that has the wisdom to establish sound principles and the courage to follow through to provide necessary oversight and enforcement. I have successfully established and led teams throughout my private sector career and my community work. Most recently, I provided leadership in the development of the plan to end homelessness in Calgary. I've had success in getting people with very different opinions, often not even liking each other, working together on a common goal. And I will bring the new council together as a first step, and I will use my experience and approach to improve relationships with our regional partners, other levels of government, our private sector, nonprofit sector partners, and the citizens of Calgary. Calgarians are expressing serious concerns about the state of city finances, and rightly so. We've got high city debt. We've got budget shortfalls suggesting service cuts. We've got unexplained expenditures over budget and not budgeted. And we've got lack of oversight and control on big ticket items. Many see a need for change in organizational culture, a change in the way City Hall works. Leadership is the key role of the mayor, but that alone is not enough. It's critical this time that we elect a mayor who has had direct responsibility for managing large organizations and budgets. And my experience in this area is unique among the candidates. Several examples which I can talk about during the session after the formal presentations. Calgarians also want a leader with a vision that inspires. This is a great city with so much potential and everyone I talk to understands that. Many, however, express frustration that our potential remains unfulfilled. They are not satisfied with general statements of the form, I have a vision. My vision, simply stated, my Calgary will be a world-class city and everything we do, all that we become will be judged against that, against that standard. Our public transit will be world class. Our environmental performance will lead the world. Community vitality will be a model for the world. Our cultural district will be world class and care for those in need will be envied around the world. And we will integrate the voices of the marginalized in a way that no one else has done. My Calgary will be a place where the best and the brightest come to work and stay to make it their home. Calgarians want a leader with a reputation for turning hopes and dreams into reality, and I have a record of doing so. We have a huge opportunity right now as Calgary undergoes the transition from a prairie town to a world-class city. It's critical that we choose elected officials 
who are capable of leading the city to greatness as Calgary takes its rightful place as a world leader. My commitment to you is to listen, is to bring all my experience, and I'd appreciate your vote. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's wonderful to see so many people here that care about the future of Calgary. Ladies and gentlemen, for a long time, Calgary has been known as the heart of the New West. My vision for our city is to make Calgary the economic heart of Canada, a beacon of opportunity and affordability for all. So how are we going to do this? We're going to do it with four key elements. One, we're going to build Calgary's infrastructure, but instead of playing catch up, we're going to shift to intelligently building for the future. We need to construct the Northeast Airport Tunnel. We need to get the Southwest Ring Road completed and create a smart snow removal policy that will address the critical accessibility issues for all of us. We need to revitalize the downtown core and we're going to address the downtown parking problems and we're going to scrap the $3 LRT parking fee. Now, Calgary will keep growing and will adapt to that growth by continued development of our road and transit systems, but with a new focus. That focus will be on building complete communities where Calgarians can live, work and play without long commutes. Two, we must continue to create and maintain safe and vibrant communities. That means renewed support for Calgary's vital services, especially police and fire. And if we're going to be the economic heart of Canada, we need to attract new people and businesses. That requires beautiful parks, new ways, new ways of delivering arts, cultural, and recreational amenities. Three, we all know it's way past time to redefine the customer service culture at City Hall. And we can do that by enthusiastically harnessing the expertise and experience of city employees. That means rewarding ideas that promote the can-do approach to customer service excellence with measurable outcomes. We also we know we need to streamline the process of obtaining permits, licenses, and approvals. By doing this, we will enhance Calgary's competitiveness through a more efficient delivery of services. Folks, we're going to make it easier to get things done at City Hall. Four. Families and businesses are increasingly choosing to locate outside of Calgary in adjacent communities to avoid the rising cost of living and running a business here. Yet, many of those people still work in Calgary, drawing on our services and infrastructure while leaving their precious property tax dollars somewhere else. We need to make Calgary cost competitive and do it through responsible budgeting where taxes are both justified and transparent and where our reserve funds are prudently managed. The city under my leadership will institute zero-based budgeting to stop us from assuming that last year's costs cannot be reduced. And finally, to ensure Calgarians get value and accountable for their hard-earned dollars, I will establish a truly independent auditor, something that I have championed for years. Now, how are we going to do that without sacrificing affordability for low-income earners and seniors on fixed incomes? Right now, what we have is a book full of guidelines and not any accountability. We're going to do things differently. We're going to make sure every decision of council can pass the McIver CAT test. CAT stands for cost control, accountability, and transparency. Quite simply, the first thing we do <coughs> to control cost of our programs, we have to ask, is it accountable to the taxpayer? Is it transparent for all Cal Calgarians to see how it's done? and understandable by all Calgarians. For the last nine years, I've been fighting an uphill battle, battle to attach these principles to council decisions. But folks, from the day that I am elected as mayor, cost control, accountability, and transparency will be the first principles considered before decisions are made. Un under my leadership, Calgary will stand alone at the top as a flourishing, competitive, and entrepreneurial city, a city that welcomes working people, small and biz big business alike, offering an affordable, high quality of life for all. Ladies and gentlemen, with your help, we can make this happen. I ask for your vote and your support on October 18th. Thank you. 
Ladies and gentlemen, let's cut the crap. <laughs> I'm sitting in your shoes today and trying to decide which of us to vote for. We're about you know, 14 candidates today, and I estimate there'll be 21 by September 28th, the nomination day. So how do you make a decision? Our media and the political pundits say Calgarians are idiots and stupid and will vote on candidates by name recognition. I strongly disagree. I know that Calgarians are much smarter than that. When you look at all of us, we all look pretty much the same. We wear the same suits, speak the same language, more or less, have the same policies, more or less, and it's all very confusing. We all look and talk like politicians. <laughs> I ask you one question. Do you vote for people who sat on council for years and never said anything, and never spoke about the real issues? Who didn't resign because they didn't believe the system worked, or are disgusted with the system? Do you vote for someone who sat on the sidelines for years and never made a difference? Or someone who spent money like a drunken sailor? Or do you vote for somebody who claims they have business experience and a track record when there's little evidence? Do you vote for somebody who's lived in Calgary for most of their lives and doesn't know how the rest of the world lives? Do you vote for somebody you would never employ in your business? <laughs> Would you let any of these people run your business? That's the key question. Would you send one of them to negotiate with Siemens in Germany to buy trains for the LRT? A multi-million dollar deal using your money. Or to source things in China to save money. Or to sit with city unions over a beer and negotiate a win-win contract. Imagine if city employees were committed to saving us money and time and providing the best service of any city in the world. Imagine if your aldermen acted as ministers and were responsible for departments and budgets rather than haggling over minutia. I commit if I'm mayor, I will cut taxes by 2.5% per year. If I can't make it happen, I will resign. I know people are going to ask me how I'm going to do it. I guarantee you I'll not cut services but I'll find ways to increase revenue by improving customer service, just like any other business, by using our overcapacity in various departments and reducing bureaucracy and costs. I've done it numerous times in business, small and big, through booms and busts in different countries, different cities. City Hall is in the service business, and that's what I bring to City Hall. I've worked with unions, without unions, with corrupt officials, incompetent officials. In Calgary, my belief is that we have some incompetent officials, but we also have great employees that have not been motivated to do their best. Imagine the WestJet culture at City Hall, where employees feel their owners, which they are, and customers feel loyal. Imagine lower property taxes. Some candidates here say that the aldermen are in the pockets of developers and that we're subsidizing urban sprawl. That may be true. But what is true is that delays in bureaucracy at City Hall is costing Calgarians more than any other factor. Time is money. Some people say, some, some people say they want a mayor who can, you know, who can fix things, and that's me. In many, let's talk about the airport tunnel. When I'm the mayor, I'll find a way to finance it, either by tolls, by private, public or getting the money from the government, uh, from the feds. I commit if I'm mayor, I'll cut taxes by 2.5% per year. If I can't make it happen, I'll resign. I'll build the airport tunnel. I'll privatize Calgary Parking Authority and increase competition. Let's show the media and the world that we will vote for people based on merit, track record, qualifications and, the, and their ideas, and not on name recognition. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brian. Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd rather not talk about me today, or I, 
and what I am going to do all by myself if I'm elected mayor. What I would like to talk about is us, we. I'm often asked when I'm campaigning, John, what are you going to do for me? What I'd really like to do is inspire Calgarians to think, above what, think about what's in it for us if we work together. What could we do here in Calgary with a city with one of the most educated populations on the planet? What could we do with people from over 150 countries? Our greatest resource is our people. In a global economy, people from 150 plus countries. And all the natural resources and still a lot of financial strength. I think we can show leadership on earth to other municipalities in other countries, let alone Canada. That's what I'd like to inspire Calgarians to think about. Rise above what's in it for you or what's in it for me. What can we do working together? I'm going to talk a little bit about my background and why I'm so very different than all the other candidates running for mayor here. Because I am very different. I'm not going to start off by talking about me. I'm going to talk about a problem that's important to you. Because my slogan is people first, the citizens of Calgary first. And I'm going to give you an example of that. An important issue to us, to all Calgarians, is the issue of the airport tunnel. The argument's been around for many years. We talked about it, getting LRT to the airport when I was on council. And you've all heard that the tunnel might cost somewhere between 50 and $500 million. And everyone has their there are methods to calculate that, but if we don't do it now, you've all heard it's going to cost upwards of a billion dollars. So I waited and I listened and I said, how come nobody ever asked for the impact study to quantify how much it's actually going to cost the citizens of Calgary if we do not do this? We know it's going to cost the bank account of Calgary, the corporation of Calgary, a billion to build the tunnel. What's it going to cost the citizens, a whole quadrant of the city stuck for an extra 15 minutes to half an hour at least a day? What's the lost productivity to them? What's the lost opportunity cost to the economy of Calgary as a whole of having that many people stuck that much longer in traffic and what could have been achieved if we just built a tunnel? My, my study of this, I did a, a quick study and it comes to over $2 billion impact to the citizens of Calgary. So add that to the cost of the tunnel of a billion, now we're talking a $3 billion decision if it's delayed versus a 50 to maybe $500 million decision, it becomes a no-brainer. And I ask, why didn't anybody ask this question, ask for this study in the past how many years? That's just one example of why I'm very different. I ask the questions that no one else asks. I think about the things that nobody else seems to think about. The impact on tens of thousands of businesses and hundreds of thousands of people didn't come first in all of this talk. So I guess I just see things that others, others don't. I'm an innovator and I can recognize good innovative ideas. And in that regard, for anyone interested, on my website we have learned the issues where we've come up with one of the best political tools. Well, there just isn't anything like it anywhere. It's been invented. In about 15 minutes flat, you can go through advanced memory techniques on the website, smartcalgaryvoters.com, which you access off my website. You can learn all about the important issues to you in this election coming up. So I would urge you to go there. That's another example of the innovation that I would bring to the city of Calgary. We've heard about these opportunities. Well, you, you kind of have to have a track record to back that up. If you talk about what we're going to do, you have to be an entrepreneur and be able to point to the track record of having not just fixed the problems, but spot the opportunities. So I think that what we need in Calgary, my belief, is we need vision, leadership, and integrity to fix our problems and also to be able to spot and capitalize on our opportunities. It starts with a Triple E City Hall. Efficient, effective, and ethical. We need a city hall that helps us achieve our opportunities and thinks of the people first. Now we all know that during campaigns, talk is cheap, ideas are a dime a dozen. What I think you need to look for is the proof of that vision, leadership and integrity with track record. Thank you. 
That was a great opening line there, Al Neuer. I like that. Back to reality. My name is Paul Hughes. Thanks, everybody, for uh, coming out today. Um, I'm, uh, I feel very privileged to sit up with these gentlemen, some uh, extremely talented individuals here. I feel like I'm an, I'm an embedded citizen. So uh, I'm, I'm looking at them, listening to them just as much as you are. Um, my, I started uh, my, my uh, life in Vancouver, BC. Uh, my parents uh, moved around, lived in a lot of northern communities, um, grew up in all four western provinces, and at the time, the two ter territories that we had. I went to my first council meeting when I was 13, and I started coaching hockey when I was 13. And at 16, I ran a marathon, trained for six months in northern Manitoba, a little town called Leaf Rapids, starting in January. And if anybody knows northern Manitoba, it's pretty cold. So I showed some discipline, ran a marathon. When I was finished school, I joined the PPCLI, joined the Canadian Army. And after the Canadian Army, I started, uh, went, attended the University of Calgary, and I started a production company in music. And I started a record label called Metanoia. If anybody's heard of uh, Peter Senge, I, uh, I use that word out of his book, uh, The Fifth Discipline, which is a shift of mind. And this is in the early 90s. Uh, I did a music festival called Highwood, booked bands like Biff Naked and Green Day, uh, Dead Milkman. Uh, after that, I uh, went on to start a hockey school, uh, worked with uh, Jerome Ginla and Chris Pronger uh, out in Canmore. Uh, I've been, I'd coached hockey the entire time. I've probably coached some 2,500 different athletes. And after that, I um, started working in Canadian North and traveling the Canadian North. So I've swum, I've, I actually swam in all of our coast to coast to coast. I've swum in all three of our oceans. I've traveled my country extensively. And my dad instilled in me uh, the proud uh, individual he is for the, for, of our country. Uh, he instilled in me a pride in my, my country that, uh, that uh, I think that a lot of us, a lot of us feel. And then within that place, within, within the context, uh, I also, uh, my son, Mackenzie is eight. I, um, I delivered him in the Slocan Valley in a, in a little cabin, about 100 kilometers from the closest uh, hospital. So that's a little bit about my background. I think that Calgary is a basis for an oasis. I think that we're all kind of looking at what's going on in Calgary and we're waiting for something to happen. And okay, what are we gonna do? This is a great place. We've got a really nice location here. There's a river, so he's looking pretty good. What are we gonna do? And I think sometimes that's where we fall short with that vision. And I do, th I, I am hearing today from these other gentlemen that there is a vision, that these, these, these people have taken a lot of time to, to consider where we're going as a city. I started something called Drilling for Soil. Uh, just put an S in front of the oil. I think that there's a tremendous amount of, of opportunity uh, feeding our citizens. I also believe that through my work with the Food Policy Council and the research that I've done with food, that and if we can connect the 111,000 empty acres of land, which is an asset for an organization, if we can connect that land base to the 140,000 people that are living at or near poverty, I think we can uh, create an opportunity for job creation and more nutritious foods within our system. And yes, yeah, certainly um, a lot of people think that I'm a one-issue person, but uh, I've only had chickens in my backyard for the last year and a half. So, um, you know, I'm not just a chicken guy. And I serve my country, I've been coaching hockey, high performance, I've done a lot of different things. So um, if we can put aside the, the one-issue part of it, that'd be great. Um, Diverting, uh, diverting resources from the landfill. We start, have to start looking at our, our, our garbage as resource. We should, we should basically outlaw the word garbage and, and, and start to make that fundamental shift, that metanoia. Um, place making in the city is incredibly important. Um, I don't have much time left here. Uh, you know, I'm feeding myself. I'm growing on my, on my own property. So we want to talk about sustainability. We want to talk about campaign donations. Let's get real, let's get real. I'm feeding myself with the food that I grow, from the, with the eggs from my chickens. Um, I am not asking for any campaign donations, so I don't, I'm not beholden to anybody. I don't owe anybody anything. So if you want to look at who's going to be going into, into, uh, into the position of mayor, I'm not saying I'm, none of these gentlemen can be bought for $5,000 or, or, or any of the women involved in this race. None of these people can be bought for that amount of money. I don't think that we have corruption at that type of level. But if we really want to see who's doing what they say they're going to do, I'm doing that right now. And I think that's where the proof is in the pudding. I think that that's where, as Calgarians, I look at Marlon Perkins, if anybody's heard of him. 
an obscure reference to the Mutual of Omaha. Do you know what he, how he got some of that great footage? Do you know how he got some of that great footage? He got, he got some of that great footage. Just look at the Fifth Estate. Thank you for the moment. He, look at the Fifth Estate uh, demo, documentary and look at how he got that footage. It's really, really interesting. Thank you. This is great. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you all for, luckily the weather stinks, so I can't say thank you all for taking a beautiful uh, summer afternoon. Mm -hmm. But thank you all for coming, and thank you all for being so engaged in the future of this great city. Let me start by telling you a little bit about me. I grew up in Calgary, not far from here as a matter of fact, um, to a first generation Canadian family that struggled a little bit while I was growing up. We didn't have a lot of money, but what I had was a lot of opportunity. I had opportunity to graduate from fantastic public schools. I had opportunity to make use of public libraries and public transit, uh, public pools where I learned to swim badly. And for that, I really consider myself a product, a child of this great community. And that's really the underpinning of everything that I do in the community today is that every kid growing up in the city, whether in the Northeast or the Southwest, whether in a newly arrived Canadian family or a fifth generation Canadian family, needs that opportunity, needs that ability to be able to succeed. And the kind of government that we give ourselves, the kind of city government that we give ourselves is integral to that. I'm a graduate of the University of Calgary where I did a business degree. I was president of the Students' Union there, which is how I really first learned about how nonprofits and governments organize themselves. I've worked in the big leagues of business. I always say I'm the only guy you'll ever meet whose two biggest clients are the, the United Nations and The Gap. They have more in common than you would think. Typically on very big numbers. I worked uh, to, with the United Nations, for example, on determining how the private sector can help the poorest people in the world. These are billion dollar, hundred million dollar decisions uh, that I worked with. But I also love cities. And when I had the chance to come back to Calgary after working and living in cities around the world, after going to graduate school at Harvard to learn about public administration, after paying off my hideous school debt, I had the opportunity to come back to this great city I love. I wrote a little bit, I thought a little bit about how cities work. And you may know me over the last few years as being the City Hall columnist for the Calgary Herald, as well as for CBC Radio One. What I do for you is sit through city council meetings. It's good that I do this for you. <laughs> because I always say that if Calgarians actually had to sit through city council meetings, we would have 100% voter turnout in the election, and none of the folks who were there would win again. <laughs> because we deserve better. We deserve a better city council, and we deserve a better Calgary. The good news is Calgarians know that already. We are a city full of innovative people, people who take risks, people who are not afraid of change. Our city council, however, needs to catch up. And that's unfortunately what we have not seen, particularly in these last three years of bitter partisanship, of fighting, of taking your eye off the ball, of spending endless hours arguing about whether to close two lanes of Memorial Drive on a sunny su Sunday afternoon in August, while you let your infrastructure deficit balloon to $1.5 billion, and while 100% of your contracts go over budget by $700 million. This is not the council that Calgarians deserve. So what I stand for is three things. Number one, sustainability. We need to build a city that is socially, environmentally, and economically sustainable. Not a city where every new house costs us more money than we ever get back in taxes. Number two, Calgary needs to be the best place in Canada to start and grow your business. That means that the city has to see itself as a problem solver, helping people succeed in business, instead of a regulator who succeeds when the, all forms are filled out in quadruplicate and every single checklist is made up. And unfortunately, that's how they see themselves now. The other thing we really, really know about what attracts great talent to a city and helps business succeed is what I call the urban fabric or the vibrancy of the city. That means that investments in things like arts, culture, parks, recreation, sports, aren't good just in and of themselves. They're good for hard-nosed business reasons because they are the things that help us succeed. And my third and final theme is we have to fix city council. 
The good news is we know how to do that. Governments around the world have reformed their bureaucracy. They've delivered better services at lower cost. It means better budgeting, much better and more independent auditing. It means a city council that knows how to ask the right questions. And that's what I offer you today. The ability for all of us to work together to help our city council achieve that better Calgary that we so want. That Calgary where we have communities, where people can walk through safely, where kids can walk to school, where you can walk to the corner store, where that second family car becomes your choice, not an absolute necessity. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that you'll join me in helping us build that better Calgary. Thank you. That was pretty good. That's going to be tough to follow. Hi, I'm Derek McKenzie. I want to thank you all for showing up this, uh, this afternoon. People ask me, why do, I, why do I want to be mayor of the city? I have no, I've never run for council. I've never belonged to a political... I have no experience doing this. What makes me think that I can handle this job? Well, I think this past three years shows that just about anyone can do this job. <laughs> I think uh, the, the, next, the next mayor of this city has got to show staunch leadership. They've, they've got to give the vision. They've got to show where we need to go and how we can do that. I think this, uh, this past council has got to address uh, the accountability and transparency issue. I think the, the, the last gentleman commented about the $700, billion, or sorry, $700 million overrun. That's a serious oversight. How, how does that even happen? Uh, I know as, uh, having a budget of my own household, it bothers me that when there's budget overruns like that. How does that happen at the city? I, I'm concerned when it happens in my house, you should be concerned about it when it happens to your house. This, and the city is your house. I think we need to keep the city moving. Uh, the number one issue is, is getting people around the city, getting people to work, encouraging people to come out and, and come to the city for business. One way to get that, to keep the city moving is to address the airport tunnel. As the third largest airport in the city, or sorry, in the country, we, we need to continue being that international spot, that international destination for people. We need to encourage businesses to come here, and if, our, if we don't have a transportation, mass transit transportation from the airport into the downtown core, people are not wanting to come down here. People don't want more roads. Last uh, platform I'm standing for is planned development. Now, I've taken a little bit of heat from uh, friends and colleagues about this and what that means. This is not to suggest that we should not build new communities, that we should not uh, grow out. But we need to start densifying our city. We have one of the largest urban footprints in, in the country. There's no reason for that. When we build more infrastructure, when we build new communities, that, those communities need more infrastructure. They need more roads, more waterworks, more electricity. That costs money to do that. And that's your tax dollars that are going up to make that happen. We need to start looking and developing and working on densification of the current neighborhoods that we have. To get people through those neighborhoods, again, we need to come back to a, a more effective and more efficient transportation system. And of course, back to, the, uh, to tie it all up, we address this through fiscal responsibility. Again, your house, you, you take in so much money, you spend so much money. You have to have a little bit in there to plan for the future as well. You can't just willy-nilly spend money like it's an endless bucket. So this means you, you have to live within the budget. And as I'm not an economist, as I'm just a common sense uh, household kind of guy, we need to keep, uh, be aware of this stuff. We need to get people in. We need to get the experts that understand economics and ad address their, their concerns. I know that this organization has got some great, uh, great ideas in there. Um, and they suggest such things as m moving away from a three-year budget uh, process, sorry, a three-year budget cycle. Uh, I think a one or a two year is certainly a great idea when you're doing your own household. Uh, you, you plan for the future. You, have, you do have a cycle, but that adjusts every year. So on that, I want to say thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. And thank you to the Calgary Leadership Forum for sponsoring this event. Leadership. Leadership, in my view, is listening. It's about being thoughtful, about being balanced, looking for the common good, discerning what community needs are, and developing with your colleagues positive solutions. And it's been my privilege to be able to serve a great city with great leaders for the last many years. <clears throat> but leadership is also about making decisions and setting priorities, doing 
what's in the public interest, having the courage of your convictions, and something we don't talk about all that often, but it means avoiding making promises you know you can't keep. That's what bothers me so much about this airport tunnel issue. It's symbolic of something more significant. Because the promise is being made to you as citizens that we can have an airport tunnel when we don't have the money. That was made evident to Council as recently as July. We do not have the money. So it would be irresponsible and wrong for me as a mayoral candidate to come here to you in an election campaign and make a promise to you that I know I can't keep. Even if I had half a billion dollars to commit to this city in transportation infrastructure, there are more important priorities that uh, face our city. That brings us bit more benefits than a tunnel would do. An east-west tunnel running under a north-south runway would be there to avoid people uh, taking a trip around the north end of the new tunnel, uh, the new runway. It's a three-kilometer shortcut. For mm, thousands of motors, when it has zero impact on hundreds of thousands of motorists, it's not worth it, even if we had it. The only way we could get it is to go and put the city deeper in debt and borrow it. And then you have to pay interest, and that ends up on the operating cost side, the operating budget. What did you cut in order to make room for those interest payments? Or, or, or raise taxes even higher? So, ladies and gentlemen, if we had half a billion dollars, I'd invest it in LRT. It's the best, most successful light rail system in North America, right here in Calgary. Nobody has a better LRT system than we do. Southeast LRT is the next priority, and City Council adopted my motion in July that gets us a practical way to get started on the LRT to the southeast. We had, it'll get us as far as Douglas did. If I had another half a billion dollars, we could take it all the way down to uh, Seton and the hospital down there and bring uh, LRT service to another 125 to 150,000 Calgarians. This year we're celebrating 100 years of our parks uh, system. It's the number one asset that Calgarians tell us they enjoy the most. 100 years from now, I would love Calgarians to bless us as, as citizens in 2010 for our foresight in creating the LRT transportation spine that helped our community cut our ecological footprint, that helped reduce Calgary sprawl, that helped us make a more sustainable city and a better, uh, more interesting city. When they look back, they'll see the decisions that we've made around LRT and transit are the ones that made this a truly great city, much as people had this kind of foresight and courage of their convictions 100 years ago. We live in a great city. In the last 10 years, Calgary has added a city the size of Saskatoon. In 10 years, if you think about what the implications of that has been. And at the same time, we've been able to add parks. We've been able to add to our transportation system. We've been able to add recreation centers. We have included, uh, got started on our uh, recycling and our curbside blue box program. All of these are great accomplishments. And it's been a tremendous privilege to have been chosen by Calgarians like yourself to be your representative, to work for you in helping to make this city what it is. I would welcome the opportunity to represent you and work on your behalf and with you as your next mayor. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that you're going to cut taxes by 2.5% per annum. How do you propose to do that? Who here doesn't think there's waste at City Hall? Put your hands up. If everybody knows there's waste. I'm going to cut out the waste, and I'm going to increase revenue. Two things that make a business work. Mr. Kazam, uh, you mentioned at another time that you will privatize Calgary Parking Authority. Will that not increase parking costs? 
No, it will not increase ca uh, parking costs. There's not been a single parkade built in Calgary in decades. We need competition. Competition brings down prices. The parkades, the parking spots that are owned by Calgary Parking Authority are inefficiently managed. And if it were privatized, you'd get people working 24 7 making it work. So it will not increase competition, only reduces prices. Uh, that's been my experience, and Calgary Parking Authority claims that the, they have the best technology and the best tools to make parking convenient. Every Calgarian I've talked to hates the current system, hates the new machines, and by privatization of the parking lots, will reduce prices. This is a question for Bob Hogsworth, and it's a combination. I've got a number of questions that are somewhat similar. So this is a compositive. Uh, why do you think uh, Calgary LRT is the best uh, in Canada? This person was in Montreal in 69, and LRT was better. Uh, and if you have so much foresight, why did the west leg go before the east leg? Is it because the mayor had two properties in the northwest? <laughs> Calgary's LRT is the best in North America based on ridership. Uh, cities all across the United States have made investments, uh, Canadian cities as well. Calgary has more ridership on our LRT than anybody else in North America. Uh, there's an uh, independent objective uh, assessment of all of our transportation infrastructure needs and projects. West LRT has been for a very long time the next leg to go, the fourth one, and uh, we got uh, going on it. The next leg after west is southeast, and once that's completed, north central comes after that. The connection to the airport is along the north central LRT, and uh, once we get through southeast we'll, and uh, get the money, we'll move forward in the uh, priority in which these uh, legs have been, uh, have been established. Question for Bob Hawksworth and all existing uh, alder, aldermen, alder persons. Uh, what did you do, do to stop the massive shortfall that is projected for next year? Uh, with the large budget deficit cuts will have to take place in a city where tax increases seem to be taboo, how would you deal with the deficit without cutting parks, funding, arts programs, uh, Planet, or any other initiatives? Right. <clears throat> um, there's one thing I, from the previous question, I, I, I just to think it's important to note, and I apologize for going back, but I don't know if people understand that the original alignment for the West LRT was uh, approved by City Council in the mid-1980s before uh, David Bronconye was ever elected either as an alderman or as a mayor. There was something implied in that question at the last that I think needed to be addressed. I apologize I didn't do it at the time but uh, there was nothing that had anything to do with uh, uh, Mayor Bronconye and uh, any land he owned that had uh, uh, to do with the uh, uh, establishment of that uh, functional study and the alignment for the West LRT. So, <clears throat> sorry, I, th it's an important point that I just wanted to clarify. Uh, City Council is not able to uh, run a deficit budget Every year, our budget, operating budget, has to be in balance. For 2010, our operating budget is balanced. What we're talking about is 2011, the third uh, year of our three-year budget. And the assumptions that City Council made in uh, establishing that budget are, uh, are changing as they do each year. And then November, City Council is going to take a look at what were some of the uh, unforeseen changes to the budget and make adjustments uh, as required. For example, the assumptions around how much the city would collect for the sale of natural gas and electricity. Those prices have dropped. The uh, revenue the city gets is based on the price of natural gas and electricity. So the assumptions are changing and uh, the revenues aren't going to come in the way they uh, were anticipated. They're, human resource costs around uh, pensions that uh, were unanticipated. So the first thing council is likely to do is to cut all the growth. I think 
we'll have to okay. wrap up here. Okay. Uh, what is your policy towards public transportation and park and ride? When it comes to uh, park and ride, I, I mentioned this uh, a, a few uh, weeks back, and it's also in my brochure. I'm probably the first one to actually put it in writing. To me, the $3 park and ride fee is, is silly. It's a regressive tax on those who are low income. It's a regressive tax on those trying to do the right thing. So how are we going to basically take $6 million out of the budget because that's what it does? Well, first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to bring to Calgary the smart card. It's a card that uh, got the idea from the Octopus card in Hong Kong. Because in the last three years I've been in corporate finance working with companies that are international, you learn things when you work with other people. So this $3 card, basically what it is, Essentially, it's a debit card that you can buy at retail stores across Calgary. You can reload online. The cash flow we generate by this card providing for all city services, not just um, transit, but for parking, for pools, recreation, etc. But I went a step further. The taxi industry said they will also support this card, so it'll be actually a truly transportation service card. And the last thing on parking, uh, again, I've put it in my brochure that uh, uh, to me, we need to stimulate the downtown. Parking is a, is a problem. We want to, uh, my job as mayor is uh, with council's help, that we will do $2 parking uh, for lunches, 11.30 to 1.30, let people come downtown to shop, to do some, uh, uh, have some restaurants, and uh, $2 all day Saturdays. For the little bit of money we lose, I'm worried about the big picture people, the $200 million we get in the uh, downtown buildings that they're not being able to survive because they can't afford. So you know what? I'm going to worry about the big picture, make sure we got a vibrant and safe downtown, and you know what? People will come. This is uh, for Craig Burroughs. Uh, could you please confirm your position, either supportive or, or against, to the, uh, LR, the uh, airport tunnel and LRT to the airport? If supportive, how would you balance this need as a priority uh, compared to other critical projects? Well, well first of all, I tell you why I have to make the, the, uh, the tough decision. Uh, in 2007, I stood up to my community and said, I'm sorry, I can't afford to build an LRT to the west side rec center. We just didn't have the money. I could not tell people at Dover or Ogden to justify that. That $800 million, ladies and gentlemen, from, from, from Westbrook, which I fully supported, to Westside, $800 million. We should have taken that money and done the LRT to the airport. Alderman Oxworth, Connolly, McIver supported that. So, ladies and gentlemen, the reason we're making a tough decision is because another council made that decision. That being said, the LRT to the airport, to me, is the number one transportation priority for this city. Without the tunnel, there is no LRT. The economic opportunity that we will lose, the tourism opportunities, the opportunity to develop the Northeast, as Alderman McIver says, that live, work, play, is right there. So that's why I'm going to support it. As far as funding, um, do I still have time? A couple more seconds. Of course, yeah. Okay. Well, the funding bottom side is, is two parts. Alderman uh, Chabot, Stevenson, and Jones stood up and said, you know what? This council made the mistake. They blew away $3 billion. They accept responsibility, and they're going to find a way to find the money. I support that. That tunnel is the responsibility of Calgarians, not Albertans or Canadians. But the responsibility of Canadians is making sure that now we've done Vancouver, we're doing Toronto, the next public transportation system to the airport will be Calgary and Ottawa benefits by us continuing to drive the money into the economy and back to the rest of Canada. Okay, thank you. Mr. McKenzie, uh, the question is, uh, have you been involved in any community work? I have been involved in, with uh, lots of community work. Uh, I've been, I, I wrestled through the University of Calgary for several years. Uh, I've been uh, trained with national team members. Currently, I'm preparing for the, going to the Commonwealth Games uh, in India. Uh, I am preparing for the Olympics in 2012. I'm quite involved with amateur wrestling, um, specifically amateur wrestling, but sport in general. Uh, I'm also involved with the community association, um, or sorry, I was involved with the community association at Country Hills. Um, I'm also involved with a political party in the varsity, uh, pardon me, the varsity constituency. So I do understand uh, policy, I do understand the community, and I try to strengthen that connection to the community. Thank you. Kenzie, do you commit to working with your council as an equal partner in managing our city's business? Of course you'd have to commit to that. They're, they're the leaders of the communities. They're the leaders of the, of the city. You have to have partnership and, and work with those people. Even if you have differing views, uh, which we all have, you have to find some way to, to work to, uh, for the common goal. Uh, I'd once, someone had once told me that even if you have um, 
difference of views, you have to believe that these people work for your best interests. Even if we have different views, business, between business and government, we have different views, but we still have to work with those guys. We still have to work with them because the economy is driven by business and the council has to work with those businesses to get the, as uh, uh, Craig had commented, we have to get the, those businesses working. We have to keep those people moving. Thank you. This is a question for Joe Connolly. What would you do to attract enough qualified medical professionals to staff the new hospital when it's opened? Thank you for the question. I think uh, what we need to look at is uh, delivering on must-haves and not nice-to-haves. And then once we've got that, we've got enough money to uh, make it an attractive city. Unfortunately, in the last few years, we haven't become an attractive city. It's been very challenging and it's been a very expensive city to live in. You know, ladies and gentlemen, we have 25 priorities at City Hall. And it's my contention, if you have 25 priorities, you really don't have any. So we need to get back to delivering on those core priorities that Calgarians expect and Calgarians are looking for. That way make the city more uh, affordable for not only professionals, but for everyone. The last census in 2009 actually showed for the first time in the 33 years I've been here that more people have left Calgary than migrated here. And that should be of a great concern to everyone in the audience. Thank you for the question. This is a question for Mr. Connolly. Um, there is much new evidence that proves water fluoridation is unsafe, not effective, and unethical. Uh, should mass medication of Calgary's population with fluoride be con continued? The city is proposing to add more fluoride into our drinking water. Um, would um, you support this? Because the belief is that right now the fluoride level in our water is above to toxic levels. Um, before I answer that, I just want to talk a, a second about the $60 million deficit. Because when uh, we were coming down to the dying days of council, I brought forward a notice of motion on how to deal with a $2 billion deficit. Because it's a lot of money. And I brought forward uh, a framework that would put the budget into three different buckets, if you will. One was critical services. One was, what efficiencies are you developing? And the last one, what are we dumping? Because I do believe there is room there that we could uh, cut back and, and save quite a bit of money. And it's so concerning that I met with Owen Tobert, the city manager, this week to talk to him further about it. And he likes my notice of motion and he wants me to reintroduce it in the future. Because it's critical that we get our hands around how we manage a $2 billion uh, budget and how we're going to cut a $60, billion, uh, $60 million deficit. How do we do that? It's not just something that you do off the top of your head. So I just wanted to address that. On the, on the issue of fluoride, I'm not a scientist. And when this came to council, it was a very divisive uh, topic. And we went through a lot of uh, presentations and it was like, your scientist is bigger than my scientist. And know that Edmonton has fluoridation in their water too. And you have to trust other people like the Alberta medical uh, health officers and people like that whose job it is to bring forward that evidence. So I've met with many of the fluoride proponents both for and against and I told them, you know what, go talk to the province because this is really their bailiwick. They're the ones who need to dictate whether it's safe or not and that's what I left them at. So they are going to go to the province and talk to them because it's their, it's their uh, portfolio that they manage, right? Thank you. This question is for John Lord. Why did uh, City Council allow the provincial government to take the municipal property tax dollars collected for public and, ca and private uh, pu public and Catholic schools to be placed in provincial revenues? Well, I can't speak for uh, City Council since I haven't been on it uh, for 10 years. But uh, that is a very interesting question and a difficult issue. The issue of how much the city uh, sends to Edmonton in property taxes is a key issue for all of us. And as MLA, I brought that issue up and served on the committee that made the very strong recommendations that the city of Calgary ought to be able to keep more of its property taxes that are collected. Uh, we do send a lot of money out of the city to the provincial government. Uh, there are political realities there in terms of who has the majority control at the provincial government level. But you can rest assured that as mayor, uh, I did bring, uh, as mayor, I would be fighting very hard on behalf of the city of Calgary. And I know the people up there personally as former colleagues. So I believe that I could have a very strong influence on changing those formulas going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for John Lord. 
Um, what are your plans for providing long-term housing to the homeless and low-income community in Calgary? Thank you for the question because I've actually done a lot of work on that. But before I answer that, I just wanted to bring up one minor point. Uh, back in 1998, uh, Don Braid of the Calgary Herald said that John Lord was almost single-handedly responsible for getting fluoride onto the ballot so people could have a choice in that election. And I do note that Don Lovett, a campaign manager for one of my worthy opponents, told me personally he is the man who brought fluoride to Calgary and was very proud of it at the time. So just uh, thought people might be interested in that. In terms of my work with housing and homelessness, I have been, I started almost as a one-man parade on the notion of legalizing basement suites as probably the only pragmatic, realistic solution to dealing with the NIMBY issues and the problems associated with basement suites that would be fixed if they could be legalized, and also to the problems of our young people finding affordable housing as they were uh, growing up and leaving home in the late homes in the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, so I started that parade. There weren't many people supporting it at the time. I continued. I never quit working on anything until I succeed. When I became an MLA, I brought it up, asked for a committee. The committee traveled the province, and we did get basement suites legalized under the provincial building codes right across the province of Alberta. I'm very proud of that, actually. I'm very proud of the work that I've done on working for affordable hope. Homeless, <clears throat> affordable housing and for homeless people. Uh, and I, I certainly have a soft spot for our young people out there trying to make a go of it in Calgary in today's economy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Nenshi, what will you do to create a, a budget process that doesn't fail Calgarians and holds city administration accountable to taxpayers? Terrific question. One of the problems that we have right now is that we have a three-year budgeting process which is terribly politicized. And it is kind of the worst of 1970s style bureaucracy. Because the departments have no incentive to do things innovative, they spend all their money at the end of the year so that they can justify having had that budget. And the only incentive they have is to get a 2 or 3% increase next year. And this leads to nonstop inflation. The good news is, uh, in my own work, I know a lot about budgeting. And there are different kinds of budgeting techniques we can use. Zero-based budgeting that Alderman McIver talks about is one of many in order to switch around how that all works. The, the deal is, though, that we have to be incredibly rigorous and disciplined about it. And the challenge that we have with this council is they've been unable to. So recently the council, all three members of the existing council who are here, voted to approve a $300 million departmental budget, the biggest one, without discussion, without debate, and indeed without a single piece of paper in front of them. We can't do that. We can't have zero-based budgeting unless you complain, or zero-based budgeting unless I happen to like your department. Everything has to be on the table. And in order to do that, we need to involve employees in finding more innovative, cost-effective ways of delivering the services Calgarians need. I spent a long time talking to city employees to understand what those ideas are, and building that flexible budgeting process is a really important first step. We have to have someone who understands how to do that, and that's what I bring to the table. <clears throat> Nenshi? How would you fund the airport tunnel so that it can be built as quickly as possible? Break the tradition and actually just answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> Nenshi.ca if you want to know about my stance on secondary suites uh, and LRT and so on and so on. So the airport tunnel. The airport tunnel has to get built. It has to get built. This council has approved it time and time again. Alderman Hawksworth, who hates it so much now, voted for it last June. But the problem is council forgot to fund it. And it is absolutely critical because as we've heard, if it doesn't get funded now, it will be a $1.5 billion project later. So let's strip away the rhetoric, let's strip away the us and them, let's strip away calling 12 community association presidents a special interest group and think about how to actually build it. So we put out a plan about a month ago on how we would build it. It involves a little bit of debt financing. We didn't know about the 123 million in the MSI. That money's just sitting there, so it's not true to say we don't have the money. It is a $150 million project, not a $500 million project. The, five, the cost of doing nothing, as the um, administration has very clearly pointed out, is 350 million. 
350 million in roadway improvements. So it's 150 million difference. We'll use the 123 from the MSI plus the 50 million uh, that council has already set aside for this program. It's fully funded. There's going to be some interest costs. I'm not going to lie to you. We're going to spend 25 or so million dollars in interest over the next 10 years, two and a half million a year. I hate that. I hate that, but this council has dropped the ball so badly. The good news is the money's there, we can get the shovels in the ground this year, and we can get this vital transportation link built. This is a question for Paul Hughes. Uh, Calgary has an obscene number of homeless people. Uh, why is Calgary housing so unaffordable, and what would you do to address the issue? Affordable housing is certainly a, a very important issue. One of the things I do is the secondary Sweet application process is um, very inefficient. And at the last forum, Craig Burroughs talked about an older, uh, an older elderly lady that uh, basically broke down in front of council. I, I mean, if I was on council at that time, I would have shut it down right now. Um, they didn't deal with that at all. And not, uh, I don't think that I'm, not, I'm not very happy with that. Um, as far as affordable housing, <clears throat> we have to um, improve the, the zoning issue for all communities. Uh, we have to get rid of NIMBYism. That's one thing that's got to get out the door ASAP. Um, we have to also create mentoring opportunities between successful families and growing families. I think that we have that capacity in the city to reach out and be very, very passionate with uh, our fellow citizens. And I think we have to look at some of the innovations in, in uh, construction. Um, we're pretty uh, addicted to building a certain way in the city and I think that there's a lot of different ways that we can start building homes that are a lot more affordable. One of them happens to be sea containers. And if you, if you Google sea containers and some of the innovations there, uh, pretty amazing. Thank you. Okay, this is a question for Mr. Hughes. What will you do to improve the city's life in terms of art and culture to turn Calgary to be a real world-class uh, city like many others? Right. Well, there's a group, uh, I'll get a little plug here for YYC Vote. Get on Twitter, hashtag YYC Vote. <clears throat> Excuse me. They, um, they talked about every time somebody says world class, there's somebody somewhere in Calgary drinking right now. So, um, <laughs> but from an arts and cult, I'm an artist to start out. I'm an abstract expressionist and I'm a conceptualist. And I put on a show here in the city of Calgary called 1111. And I went to CADA and I said, could I have $1 per artist? I was asking for $1,111. Didn't get it. Went to the provincial government, didn't get any money. Went to the federal government, didn't get any money whatsoever. We got kicked out of the Art Gallery of Calgary. It's a, a local uh, institution that we fund from taxpayer dollars. And we were going to have nothing but Calgary artists there. So um, my personal experience has been somewhat negative with some of the arts communities and some of the arts funders. And I think that uh, having uh, specific dates for art funding has to change. The entire um, landscape of creativity and art in our city has changed dramatically. Um, there are a tremendous number of gifted artists, but we have a lot of dollars going into the hands of art organizations that are not spending it wisely. And as a citizen, as a taxpayer, I want to see an artist and an art organization or an artist-run centre doing everything they possibly can to um, make get the best bang for the buck. So to take us into a world-class, drink it up boys, a uh, world-class uh, city from an art perspective, we need to embrace our artists, we need to embrace the creativity, creativity in our city, which is phenomenal. So when we're looking at problems and from a council perspective, we need to include a creative and innovative component to it because right now, the way we are making decisions in this city, um, for me, uh, I think we can do a lot better because of our, our addiction to doing it a certain way. It's 2010, things have changed. We need to embrace different ways of making decisions and running our city. Thank you. For Rick, <laughs> um, traffic and transportation in the ring road are the biggest concerns for Calgarians. How do you plan to alleviate the problem? Well, sh traffic, transportation, uh, short term, we need to work with the province and get that southwest leg of the, of the, uh, the ring road completed. Uh, we all know that a uh, C-shaped road is non-functional. If it, you make a ring out of it, then suddenly it becomes functional. Now, we, we need, as, as mayor, uh, I intend to use the good relationship that I have with the leaders of the, uh, all three of the major political parties uh, in Alberta to uh, work with them to get that done. Uh, other things that we need to do to deal with traffic, 
there's short, a lot of short thing, term things, but I want to talk for a second about the long term thing. I want to talk about building complete communities because that's how we're going to solve the problem long term. And I think you want a mayor that is actually looking for long term solutions. The bottom line is if we build complete communities, that is how we will long term catch up with the traffic uh, situation. What I mean by that is if we get more people living downtown, there's uh, over 100,000 jobs downtown. If we get another 10 or 20,000 people living downtown, a lot of those, we hope, the people that take those homes will perhaps go to those jobs and it will require less other people to stuff themselves onto the roads and the transit systems to get there because there'll be more people closer by to walk, cycle, or even have a shorter transit ride. In the suburbs, we need to get jobs in the suburbs. What, what are realities about Calgary? Uh, this is a great question because what we know about Calgary is most people live on the west side of the city and most of the jobs are on the east side of the city. The three major job centers in Calgary are at the airport, downtown, in the southeast industrial park. We also know that the worst transportation links in the city are from east to west. Big problem. What, ha what, what if, what if, under my council, we found opportunities to have light industrial and office jobs in the west side of the city? And I can tell you now three examples of where councils weakened and planning departments weakened in the past and didn't do that, and they're all shopping centers today. All wonderful shopping centers, but they should have included jobs. Shaughnessy, West Hills, and Crowfoot. In the future, with me as mayor, when those opportunities come up, we'll get some jobs. We'll get, to, we'll get jobs in the other side of the city, and that's how we'll solve the long-term problem, which is what I'm interested in. Thank you. This is uh, for Rick McIver. How would you manage the growing debt level of the city uh, when the challenge is to balance that against new projects? Thank you for the question. Well, one of the first things I do is, is what I've been doing all along, is by say, knowing when to say yes to good expenditures and saying no to inappropriate ones. Uh, we're going to have to go through a department by department review uh, and look at our expenditures to manage that debt. We're going to have to take, take a particularly hard look at the uh, NMAX debt, who uh, has risen dramatically all the, over the last few years, although the uh, dividends to Calgarians has not ri risen at the same rate as the debt has. And, uh, and we're going to apply some proper accounting principles, which, uh, which, which means that you spend it when you've got it, you actually make financial decisions based on facts. Um, and I'll give you an example of when I tried to get facts. I, I actually went out and got some uh, expert advice on that airport tunnel in the last meeting. Somebody that said that they could build the 250 meters that we could we would need to go into the taxiway and the runway to get the air, the, and that would come out, that, that's included in the $50 million that council's already had. And it was an independent estimate. So I asked council to say, well, let's send this to the administration and let's get the facts back next week so we see how good this thing is and then we can put it out to tender. I have to tell you, my colleagues that are running for council Council both said, no, we won't allow you to have the facts. They voted against that. Those are the types of things I'll do. I'll go get good information based uh, from experts, whether those experts are within the city and without, and I'll apply those to the financial situations facing Calgary today. Mr. Stewart, how will you bring cohesion to the council process? We, we simply must get council working as a team. And I've had considerable experience bringing people who don't agree and sometimes people who don't even like each other together working towards a common purpose. I believe if the vision is inspiring enough, people will work together towards uh, the, the long range goals. So that's what I would do. St start by looking at priorities, shifting priorities if we need to do that so that we're considering the long term impacts of all the things we do, develop a vision that's inspiring, and charge the council with working towards the common good for the city as a whole. Thank you. Mr. Stewart, <clears throat> uh, regarding your homeless solution, what other forms of long term supports are you going to put into place, uh, i.e. drug and alcohol treatments, and uh, ongoing support? That's it. Thank you. I was thinking of another use for the buns. I think you could toss one at those politicians who don't answer the question. <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting up here and I don't know how frustrated you are back there, but I'm, I'm seeing politicians playing that traditional game of here's what I want to say to hell with the question. So what was the question? <laughs> <That's not good. laughs> I'm glad you asked me about affordable housing. 
<laughs> I was the, the uh, CEO of the Calgary Homeless Foundation. I provided leadership as we developed the 10-year plan to end homelessness in our city. We shifted the culture of that organization from and the agencies in our city from managing homelessness, just looking, keeping people warm in the, in the wintertime and keeping them alive, to actually ending that uh, plague on our on our community. Once we made that cultural shift, everything started to be easier. So there's a whole bunch of solutions to the homeless problems. Most of them are contained in that plan to end homelessness and I'd be glad, although now I've used my minute and I'm afraid the buns are going to start to fly. Thank you. This is a question for Kent. Uh, what are you planning to do to make Calgary a place, a safer place to live and please be specific? Well, thank you very, thank you very much for the question, and uh, it's very easy to me to answer that one. I, as I alluded to earlier, I'm a, a victim of crime, and I know how it. Uh, is that working? Oh. I'm not sure that's working. Is this is this better? Hello, does that work? As I alluded to earlier, uh, I'm, a, I'm a victim of crime and I know how crime can interrupt uh, both uh, an individual's life as well as uh, a family's life. And uh, there is no uh, ability to enjoy one's community if they don't feel safe. That's why I'm uh, committed to putting uh, 500 more police officers on the street in the next six years. And here's why. Right now, Calgary is some of the fewest police officers per capita of any major center in Canada. That's not right, okay? Our citizens deserve to feel as safe as anyone else's citizens. Our citizens deserve the protection of the police officers as much as anyone else. And I will fight for that, I will commit to that, and I will ensure that the provincial government follows through on their promises to work with the city in rectifying what has uh, so far been a shortfall of police officers on Calgary streets. Thank you very much. Kent, this is a conglomerate question. In 2001, Joe Clark was the parade marshal for the Pride Parade. Since then, a few aldermen and women have come out, but never the mayor. How many of you will be on Stephen Avenue for the Pride Parade next Sunday? And it's, it, the Gay Pride Day has been proclaimed by the mayor as an official day. Uh, I wonder what a, life, what, li what a lifestyle should be proclaimed as mayor. Will you try to pro proclaim this sexuality identity? Well, thank you very much for the question. And it has been my honor and privilege to have been the, the, uh, or the, the MLA for Calgary Buffalo. And Calgary Buffalo represents downtown Calgary. And for the last uh, six years, I have uh, taken part in the Pride Parade. And it will be my honor and privilege to take part in the Pride and Parade again this year. Actually, I uh, was the runner-up to be a Pride Parade Marshal this year to a, to a much more deserving candidate, Tony Berry, who's in our uh, uh, GBLT community, who's out there singing and doing some really neat stuff in the community. So I deserve to come second. But nevertheless, I will be there I will be proud of our uh, GBLT community. I have stood for human rights and equality amongst all people and our ability to have opportunities for everyone in this city, whether you're rich, poor, gay or straight or whatever. That is one thing I will stand for and fight for. And in my city, everyone will get opportunities to succeed. And I will gladly be there at the Pride Parade. Well, thank you very much, and I'll end very much like I started. I thank you all for coming out and participating in the democratic process. It truly has been an honor to be here. Like I said earlier, I've been born here, I've been raised here, I've taken part in everything this city has to offer, and I will make decisions that reflect that for both today and tomorrow. Our citizens need options and opportunities to create valuable and vibrant lives. I will strive for that as this city's mayor. And tell you what, I will have a vision for the long term as well. I have three nephews who are in this city who I want tomorrow to be a better day for them as well. But like I said, the primary issue facing uh, City Hall is public trust. 
First thing I'm doing to show, I'm leading by example, is I'm disclosing all donors. So you can see that you, I, who I've donated to my campaign and trying to influence it. Secondly, I'm able to put a developer and lobbyist registry in place. It's been far too long that developers and business interests have been running City Hall. That day will end, and it will day end when I become mayor. Third thing I will put in is an independent auditor. That auditor will report to you, the citizens of Calgary, not to City Hall, where things can get whitewashed. I will bring a new day at City Hall. We have numerous people who are running on a, uh, who have been aldermen, who have been here for a long time, and we've seen a broken, dysfunctional council. We need to move forward. We need to have new vision there, and I will bring that new vision. Thank you for attending. Thank you for listening. Let's make Calgary as, as great and as wonderful as it can be. Thank you very much. Sorry, I, I didn't understand the instructions. <laughs> Maybe I'm a typical politician. I want to thank uh, all the candidates on your behalf. I think we have a remarkable group of committed citizens, and I'm uh, pleased and proud to be one of those. As we consider who we will vote for on October the 18th, I go back again to the critical question, who can best steer the ship out of this storm? I think as a first step, you should ask yourself, what do I want my city to become? And what do I expect of those I elect? And then start asking questions of the candidates and don't stop until you get the information you need. If you, along with those I've spoken to, want a council to work as a team for the common good, if you want solid, effect effective management of city finances and assurance of sustained services, if you want a le leader whose vision inspires, if you want someone you can trust to do the job, then look for evidence in the only way possible. And for me, that's past experience. Who has created and led successful teams? Who has experience in managing large organizations and budgets? Who has gone beyond, I have a vision, trust me, to articulate a vision in terms that inspire, clear enough that you can hold the candidate to account? Who has a record of getting things done? Then you will have what is needed to make an informed choice on October 18th. And the city and all who live here now and for years to come will be better for your choice. I ask you to look at my record and I ask for your vote on October the 18th. Thank you again for your active participation in this important forum. Thank you. I'm Rick McIver, if, as if you need reminding. But uh, I'd like to thank the Calgary Leadership Forum for, uh, for this opportunity today. And I, I would like to say, after being in Calgary almost 30 years and having raised a family and having nine years on city council, you need to think about who you want to be your next mayor. And if you think about the big problems now that, that the thing people are talking about, I think you're looking at the guy that has brought the solutions. If you talk about the airport tunnel I just laid out, I brought a, brought a solution to council already. If you look at the $60 million problem council's going to have at budget time, it was me all along that said, I was the only one that didn't support the budget knowing this was coming at us. It was me all along that said, we need to redo this budget. This budget system is broken. I have the guy that's been bringing the solutions. And I can tell you what, at this crucial time, in fact, I'm the guy that's pointing out that if we don't build the tunnel, it'll be Bob's half a billion dollar bungle. Because it will cost us at least a half a billion dollars more based on the same attachment to the report that he points at if, if we don't do it. And, and so you know what, folks? This is no time for on-the-job training. You want somebody that's been there, you want somebody that knows City Hall, and you want somebody that's had the courage to stand up and act independently when necessary and say yes to the right things and no to the right things and put and actually put teams together when necessary and be part of actually putting impossible deals together like the annexation that we got agreement with Rocky View. I'm that guy. Uh, respectfully, I'm asking for the opportunity to lead this city after October 18th. Thank you. Imagine Calgary is a document that really kind of um that doesn't kind of it does outline where we can go as a city in the future and it was it was a, a document that 16,000 plus Calgarians were part of. So it's really presumptuous of 12, 13, 14, 15, 21, however many people are going to be up here saying that we can run the city and we know the, all the answers. You guys, citizens, know the answers. 
Now, how do we engage citizens and how do we create citizen engagement capacity? That's really the challenge, I think, for the next mayor. Um, I'd also like to just, you know, take the whole thing and turn it upside down. And, you know, here's a great team. Here's a mayor's team. We all run the city together. We all come up with the ideas because these guys are pretty smart. So I'm sure with your cooperation and with these gentlemen, we could really change things, but that's not going to happen. Back to reality, Hughes. So <laughs> citis, citis, being a citizen versus being cynical. Um, being growers, not mowers. Um, doing more with a little. Return on investment. Embracing high performance in all aspects of the city. Open the books and keep them open. Triple E, John talks about Triple E. I say Triple E is every expenditure is examined. Audit before the election, I don't know who, uh, there's a lot of people in here involved in not for profits. I know that for a fact. Who has voted on their next executive before seeing the treasurer's report? No one. Where's that all? What's that all about? How come we don't have an emergency meeting of council right now? Give the resources that are required for that audit to happen so the voters know what's going on down in City Hall and we just don't get it from us, a bunch of talking heads. Even, even, more, important, even more important than the candidates is the voters. You've got to get out and you've got to encourage people to get out. And I think we're going to kick some Edmonton butt. There's a challenge from an Edmonton gentleman as far as uh, the voter turnout. Uh, new game, new rules. And democracy is more, in my mind, democracy is more than voting once every three years. So keep hitting the pavement, everybody. Keep growing food. Keep, keep helping out your neighbors. And keep being great citizens. Right on. We do have a problem. The biggest problem in this city is, in fact, our city council. And what we need to be able to understand is that the people who got us into this problem are sadly not the people who can lead us out of this problem. And that's a situation we face with all the folks who, good people all, who are here uh, trying to tell us the get of the problem. Today we heard Alderman McIver say he would get rid of the $3 park and ride fee, the one he championed and voted for. We heard people talk about building complete communities when all of the aldermen here voted for a last minute gut of Planet, which came out of Imagine Calgary. I was one of those 18,000 people who worked on that to make it happen, which will increase our taxes over time by $2 billion. These are sadly, friends, not the people who can get us out of this situation. They have been, to use the bad cliche, fiddling as the city burns. And for them to now say, I'm happy to put down my violin and pick up a watering can is a little hard to believe. The good news is we have folks who are able to go, are able to make this change. And in me, I give you not only a fresh voice, a new voice, new ideas, but a new voice and new ideas that actually know where they're coming from and what they're talking about. I'd like to think not for nothing did I sit through all those city council meetings. But in reality, all summer, we've been releasing every week a series of better ideas. They are in-depth details on how we'll deal with things like affordable housing, like our transit system, uh, like the funding the airport tunnel. The latest one that we released this week is on governance reform. I recommend it as an excellent sleep aid if you are insomniac. It is, however, unbelievably important, unbelievably important to reform our council, to bring people in, to have authentic conversations with Calgarians, and to develop solutions together. So I encourage all of you, learn more about all the candidates. Spend time at nenshi.ca, read the better ideas, give us feedback. I'm happy to be graded on this stuff, Alderman McIver. And give us feedback and help us move forward. Because together with your support, I can help bring you that better Calgary that we all deserve. Thank you. Well, thank you. It's always easy, of course, to criticize. And everyone has good ideas. What are truly the diamonds in the gravel of those ideas? But most importantly for you, the decision on who has the best overall track record to prove that they're going to deliver on what they say, who is best able to deliver on what they say, who has the best political, financial, community building, um, best track record bottom line, of who's going to be able to do the best job on your behalf to build this great city of ours. I said, I invite you to look at my track record and compare it to anyone's. SmartCalgaryVoters.com is a very innovative political tool that will help voters get informed, and we are actually showing leadership in doing something about getting Calgarians engaged. That's just one of the many innovative things that I have been doing 
all along in my political track record. I said, so we're actually doing stuff, showing by example, and I can point to my track record to prove that I can do what I say I'm going to do. And that's why I invite all of you to visit johnlord.ca and see what we are actually doing and what we've actually done and can prove it. That's all I ask. Just compare our track records and ask yourselves who is best able to deliver on what Calgarians need. Thank you. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Peter Drucker is a famous management guru, and he once said that leadership is all about results. And I spoke to you today, you heard about my results, you heard about my results in business, and you heard about my results in council. And you know, council's not broken. You don't get to pick your team in politics, and you certainly don't get to pick your team in business, but you still have to deliver, regardless of the environment. You still have to deliver results. And that's what I think I've done for my ward, and I want to go forward and do that for the city. I put together a vision. It's on the back, it's on this little card, or you can go to my website, Joe for Mayor. But it's your vision, it's not my vision. At the end of the day, I'm a business guy, I'm a marketing person. So I went to my ward and went to community leaders and I said, go to this website, it was called telljoe.ca. And you came back with three things, and let me tell you what they are. First of all, build a great city for everyone, but especially our children. We're behind in ice rinks, we're behind in soccer fields, we're behind in recital halls, music halls, all that kind of stuff. And if we don't keep our kids busy, we're gonna be in enormous trouble in 10 years. The second one, and I think this is self-evident, is let's get Calgary moving again. You know, we can quibble about the price of parking downtown, I believe it's too high, but just the availability of parking is a problem. The fact that we can't plow the roads in the winter, and the fact that you can't find parking in the downtown is a major problem. It hurts us economically, and we need to change that if we're gonna move forward as a city. And then the last thing is, we need to run the city in a more business-like fashion. I told you about the 25 priorities. We need to reduce those, because most of those are nice-to-haves. They're not must-haves. And right now, we're living in an environment where we need to deliver on must-haves, and we need to deliver on them well. And I'm the person that can do that. Please check out my website or grab a flyer at the back. Thank you for your time today. Make it a great Sunday. We've heard lots of great ideas and great discussions of where we need to go with this city. But we have to recognize that the goals of business and the goals of the government are not one and the same. The goals of business is strictly to, to, to make a profit, but government has to deliver services. We certainly have lots of successful businessmen up here. We certainly have people that are in the government right now, but we certainly are recognizing that we're, in a pro we're, we're facing problems, we're facing issues. One way to address some of the issues is to look at uh, cost overruns that the city is going through or has gone through. We need to look at all those and re look for efficiencies, look for uh, ways to improve uh, the financial crisis that, that's coming, that's here. I've had the opportunity to travel all over the world in the last couple of years through amateur sport. Uh, I've traveled to a number of cities. I engage those citizens in, in those cities to see the problems that they're facing. And I ask how, they can, how we can use their solutions and apply that to Calgary. I'm always concerned when I hear that we're going to face lower taxes or, and increased services because inevitably that's not what happens. When you lower taxes, you lower services. When you increase taxes, you get increased services. But we need to have a strike of balance between those two things. As we start off this evening, we do need a new bus driver. The city needs a new bus driver and I want to be that new bus driver. I'm not bogged down with some of the other issues that the councilmen here that are, my colleagues are facing or with. I look forward to being your new mayor. I look forward to being the new bus driver on October 18th. Thank you. I would love to give you two minutes of West Wing music and inspire you to walk out the door. But uh, the reality is my job as a, as a candidate here is to start talking about facts. We've heard a lot of talk today about visions. And I'm sorry, I'm going to point it out now because it's going to st the game starts now. And Rick, I like you, and you know that, but the reality is uh, I have concerns what you're promising when you deliver. If this council for nine years listened to you the majority of the time, we'd have no interchanges, we'd have no RTs, we'd have no additional police officers, we'd have nothing. But yet, he's going to promise us the world. I'm surprised he's not going to give us 100 days of, uh, of sunshine for next summer. So let's get back into basics. 
And I talk about his CAT scan of uh, cost control, $60 million in the red, $2 million to subsidize a private business in his own ward. He talks about accountability, votes against a 5.5% raise, but puts it in his pocket, and talks about transparency. He wants independent city auditor, but he fires the one they call the rock star. Now, I tell you what, I'm going to take you to my dog pound. And my dog pound is D for decisive. When you make a decision, you stick with it. O for openness. If you're going to be open, let people know about what's going on at City Hall about the City Auditor. Because I want to know what's going on, because all of us want to know what's going on. And the last thing is good governance. How can you lose hundreds of millions of dollars in tendering process? You were, Rick, you are on the audit committee with me. You're on it now. You lost touch. Like, how do you do that as our fiscal hawk? Bottom line is this, Calgary. We are a great city. And I don't want to take shot at one person, but I think it's time that we need to start talking about stuff respectfully. But I do respectfully. It's not, I, I like him as a person, but I'm after his politics. We live in a great city, ladies and gentlemen. It's going to be a better city because you know what? I'm proud that we've worked together for our history. But let me tell you something. Our future is only getting better, and I'm so proud to be a, Cal a Calgarian, and I want to be here for a long time, to, as, as long as you'll have me to be your mayor, because it's all about giving back to your community. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, to be a part of this process. But I'm going to say to you that uh, the reason I'm talking about an airport tunnel is that it's symbolic of a larger leadership issue. And I'm going to continue to ask what kind of a leader will make you a promise on which they know they cannot deliver. There is no money. Now, for this, those of you who are wondering where this $123 million came from, we don't have it. It's assuming that the province maintains the level of funding for the next eight years that they uh, are committed to two or three years ago. And that's, we get $17 million each and every year for the next eight years, assuming they maintain their current level of funding. If they don't, we don't get that revenue uh, coming in to uh, invest in any of our infrastructure. If you're going to start with this tunnel, you got to build it next week after the election. You got to borrow the money, all of it, not just the tunnel, but all the associated roadways as well. It's a $500 million uh, commitment that you will eventually be making. And you got to borrow for it. And that goes on to the operating budget. No one's telling you how much that's going to increase your taxes or where they're going to cut services to pay for it. The tunnel runs east and west under a new runway, 700 meters, 700 meters in length. 700 meters, not 215. So Alderman McIver can get us into the ground, 215 meters, but how are we going to get out the other side? You cannot build the tunnel that he's proposing. Like, come on, this is not a, a, a project that can be built that you're being promised here. And if you want to make uh, decisions based on evidence, look at the independent traffic assessment that uh, the airport authority posted on their website last week. If you want to check it out, you can look at mine uh, as well. The closure of Barlow will add 100 vehicles per hour during the AM and PM peak to Deerfoot Trail. Traffic on McKnight goes down uh, as, okay, thank you. Politicians talk and talk. And I have two minutes again to talk again. I've said everything I want to say, but it's my two minutes. So if you'd please close your eyes for a minute, take a minute of silence, and if you would, tap into your hearts, your brain, and your souls. Imagine a 2.5% reduction in taxes. Imagine city employees who love to go to work. Imagine Calgarians who feel that city hall is theirs. Imagine an airport tunnel under the runway. Imagine cheaper parking. Imagine a lower cost of living. I commit that Calgary will be better to live in, work, and play in. That's my commitment. Otherwise, I'll resign. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go home.